so today we are going to start our lectures in human computer interaction. And what we're going to do this class and next Tuesday is we're going to talk about well, what do we really mean by human computer interaction? What's involved in human computer interaction? And just really give you a overall sense and idea of what this class is going to be about and what types of knowledge and information really makes up the world of human computer interaction. All right, so the first question we want to answer, of course, is, since this is a class on human computer interaction, is, well, what is human computer interaction? Now, you'll notice that I actually have, what is HCI? HCI is actually the, uh, an acronym. It's the short version of human computer interaction. So if you happen to see that, you're talking about things that we're going to talk about in this class. So what exactly is that? Well, it's the study of interaction between people and computers. Now, last class we mentioned very briefly what we mean by computers. Does anyone remember? Yeah, so anything that involves technology, right? It's how we interact with it. It can be a tablet, it can be a smartphone. I think someone mentioned it can be a car. Those sorts of things. These are things that are being more and more computerized. It's dealing between humans and the digital world. And if you actually look at HCI, what you find is it's not just one particular area of expertise that goes into the body of knowledge. You'll find that there are people who are into HCI from all areas pretty much of almost any domain. So things like computer science, obviously, and then information technology. That's where you ha will have the most people who are into human-computer interaction. There's also the second most obvious, behavioral science. Right? We're talking about humans, we're talking about computers and how we interact. You will find some people who have a background in both. I happen to be one of those people. I have a background in both computer science and psychology. Kind of weird when I was going through school, but now it's more normal. So I want to encourage you, if you think you, you'd like something weird, go for it. You could one day be someone like me. I'm such a great, yay, I'm such a great role model. All right, so there's also things such as design. Now this includes design for interfaces and those sorts of things, but also general design. You have people who actually major in design like in graphics and design, they are also part of human-computer interaction. Now, I'd love to tell you that I have a great artistic flair, except I don't. But on occasion, I have students who come to this class that are really good artistically. They're really good with technology. That is a great combination to work in user experience or human-computer interaction. Also, things like ergonomics. Do you know what ergonomics is? Anyone? Does it deal with papers? Yeah, er, well, ergonomics deals more with things that fit the human body. So, like if you go to the Relax the Back store, anyone been to, been to one of those stores? No. Go into one. They have the world's most comfortable chairs. They also happen to be the world's most expensive chairs, which is probably why you haven't gone in them. I've never bought anything from them, I just go and enjoy. But it's basically, ergonomics is designing things that fit the human body in a manner that is better for humans and more comfortable. It's a little bit older than human-computer interaction, but it's still part of it. Because think about it, I see some of you, you have your smartphones, right? Do you think there are ergonomics involved in the smartphone? Yeah. Of course. There are a lot of other fields of study I'm going to go through quite a number of them. In fact, I have a slide that shows you a whole bunch. And if I really want to torture you, I'll tell you that you have to memorize them all. We'll wait till we get to that slide and see how excited you are about memorizing everything. Now, one of the things that's really important about HCI, because it's great to study this interaction between people and computers, right? It can be fun, it can be interesting. But that's not solely the goal. We, of course, want to gain knowledge. But the primary goal is to improve the interactions between our users, we as humans, and 
our digital products. So that really is the primary focus. We want to learn all of this information so that we can improve our products, improve the interaction between humans and these products. And when you get out into industry, if you have something that has good usability, it's much more likely that you are going to have a product that's going to sell better. You know, people don't like talking about money, but you have to remember, you go out in an industry and you have a job, if you want to keep that job, does the company need to make money? Yeah, they do. It's a balance. You need to remember that. So we want to design systems that minimize barriers between the human cognitive model, things such as how we think, how we deal with the social world around us, in terms of particularly what we want to accomplish. We're going to be talking about goals and goal-directed behavior later on in the semester. And the, the computer's understanding of the user's task. Now, why do I say the computer's understanding of the user's task? How many of you have tried to do something with a digital system and that system doesn't understand what you're trying to do? I can give you, I can give you a great example, well, for me, that I dealt with recently. How many of you are familiar with plants versus zombies? I know, it's an awesome game. The rest of, the rest of you who aren't, you have to go look it up. All right, so plants versus zombies just came out with Plants vs. Zombies 2. Right, so very excited, what do I do? To test it out for my daughter, of course. <laughs> I download it. They have some new gestures that, you, uh, that, they, that they teach you. One of the new gestures to get rid of some of these zombies is you pinch. So, okay, I decide to pinch. Well, it just so happens that I have long nails. I cut them recently, after I got the game. <laughs> We're testing, of course. Because what happened when I tried to pinch? It's hard. Yeah, the, yeah it was very hard. The, the, you know, basically, my tablet, and it was worse on my iPod, it had no clue what I was trying to do. And I'm like, obviously, they did not test this on females who have nails. So if anyone ever asks, why do we need females in computing, that's one reason why, because you want people to play Plants vs. Zombies. I'm, I'm kidding. Actually, I'm really not. But, but yes, but things such as that. So we really want to look at what are we trying to do in terms of our interaction with a product, and we want that product to be able to understand what we are trying to do and to respond appropriately. Because if it doesn't respond appropriately, who gets frustrated? The user. Yeah, the computer doesn't care. So I had mentioned I was going to mention some, some more specific areas that we need to really look at to understand human-computer interaction and study them. And if you look at this list here, this actually isn't even the exhaustive list. We'll get to that a little bit later. If you look at this list here, it still has a number of different areas and aspects that influence our interactions or can influence our interactions, actually is more appropriate. So, let's take a look at them. Cognitive science. Who's heard of cognitive science? A couple of you. All right, so cognitive science is really a study that brings together very much psychology, particularly cognitive psychology, and computing. It's really understanding how the mind works and understanding things such as how we learn. How much can we easily remember? because we do have you know, certain limits in terms of short-term memory, for example. What do we find pleasant and unpleasant? Why do you think that's important? That's a determinant of success for that. That's right. That's a, a, actually a pretty big determinant of success for many, many products. Are you going to use something you don't like? No. I know some people think, oh, well, that's kind of fluffy, right? I'm going to ignore the fluffy stuff because we are hardcore IT people. Mm -hmm. Except you want your product to sell. And also think of yourselves as consumers. You're not going to start using things that you don't like. What motivates or demotivates people? 
We're going to talk a little bit more about that later because that is particularly interesting, especially when you are talking about areas such as gamification, which is being used more and more in business, is being used more and more in school. Gamification. It's basically taking, and we'll talk more about it um, later on, it's basically taking uh, those aspects of gaming that motivate people to keep wanting to play and putting that theory and knowledge into the development of other types of either learning systems, for example, or even in business. So somehow someone is convinced that they're going to make accounting really fun and interesting. <laughs> Haven't figured that one out yet, but they're sure. And things such as perceptions. Now the perceptions is really fun. We're going to talk a little bit about some of that today. Ergonomics, which we talked about already. The ergonomics of sight, hearing, motion. All right, so you go to the Relax the Back store. They're going to have the chairs that have the arms that are at the right level. They'll have the pictures of what angle should you be looking at your screen. All of those fun and exciting things. The physics of sight, hearing, motion, and color. So how do we bring information in the world through our visual cortex, for example? How is that processed? What about smell? What about touch? Those sorts of things. Now here's one that is particularly interesting, especially in Miami. Cultural differences. So things such as shapes, colors, and images that may have cultural meaning. Because some of these do differ depending on the culture that you're from. All right, so in the US, in Western culture, if you are getting married, what color do you wear? White. It does depend on the culture. If you are Chinese, what color do you wear? Red. Yes. So very, very different meanings. All right, here's another one that's a little trickier. We'll go to jump from weddings to funerals. I know, I'm bringing all these happy, happy thoughts up, right? All right, in the US, what color do we wear for funerals? Black. Black. Now, if you look at the Chinese culture, you also wear black. But there is a color that you are absolutely not supposed to wear, ever, at a funeral. They will kick you out of the Buddhist temple. Anyone know what that is? Red. Why? Because in the Chinese culture, red symbolizes life. And if you wear red to that funeral, even if it's little red stripes on your shirt or your, uh, your suit, I know this, I experienced this personally myself, actually. I like bringing my personal experiences in here. You are insulting the ancestors. So you really can't do that. So if you are building a site for a funeral home, should you be using red? Yeah, probably not. Especially if they live in a community where there are a lot of Asians. They're going to look at that site and say, yeah, no. You are insulting my ancestors. So those sorts of things. Some of them tend to be really subtle, but they can make a difference. Then there's demographic differences, age, gender, physical abilities, and disabilities. Now, demographic differences, you have to be really careful with. Because a lot of times, we think there are demographic differences that make a difference in situations where they really don't. Let's start with an example of when it does make a difference. So if you are building a educational software package that's going to be used with four-year-olds, do you think age is going to be a demographic you're going to need to worry about? Yes. Do you think gender is something you're going to need to worry about? No, it's not. Some people think that you do. Why? Because of stereotypes. One of the things we don't want to do, and we'll talk about this more again later in the semester, is bring stereotypes and what's called gender typing into our designs. You want to make sure that your designs and your systems are not actually creating a problem. There will be people who will boycott your product if you make it very gender typed. There are also educational systems, for example, that will then say, no, we will not use this because it has gender typing in it. It is inappropriate. All right, here's another one. This is my favorite. Age. 
when it comes to older folks? What is a stereotype when it comes to the older generation and being able to see? Big letters, big icons, big numbers. Who thinks that that is true of the majority of older individuals? Yeah, a couple of you. I thought that at one point. And then my grandmother gave me a big lesson on how wrong I was. If you actually look at the research, what you really find is that the older generation, the majority don't want bigger fonts. You know, we do have these inventions called glasses and contacts that they do tend to use, and they don't want to look old. So here's my example of what I did. So here, my, here I had my grandmother. She was about 90 years old at the time. And I'll ask you later in the semester if I gave you this example, so just remind me. So I go into, I don't know, a CVS or something, and I see this, what ends up being a gag gift, right? It was a, a remote control with really big buttons and really big numbers. And I'm like, ah, oh, I will give this to my grandmother. She'll be thrilled. She won't be continuously asking me to change the channel for her because she can't see the buttons. So that was a present that I gave her. Can't remember what holiday it was anymore. I was too traumatized afterwards. She opened that up and she looked at it and she practically threw it at me. She was so insulted that I would actually get her this thing for old people. It was terrible. Fortunately, ended up it was actually a gag gift, so I kind of like, ah, yeah, it was a joke. <laughs> so you do need to be really careful about that. We're going to talk about later in the semester how to really design products that fit for your users. You need to do something very important with them. You need to talk to them. You need to know who they are. Part of this class is going through and learning who your users are. How do you figure that out? And how do you translate that into design? Then, of course, there's also technology, input and output modalities. Are you using audio? Is it only vis visual? Is it a combination of things? Those sorts of things. <coughs> 